Cool. All right, let's pick a title. You said a lot that I got to write down, by the way. <laughs> so yeah. there was one that was my favorite. I hope you got it, but go ahead. Which one? Well, yeah, let's see what you got, and I'll. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're being tested now. This is the lightning round. Go. Backwards D's and things. I guess novels. That's a thing. You need to submit things. A ketchup agent and a mustard author. <laughs> I'm planting seeds right now. And this is why. It's about a guy. One of those is easy to accept, encouraging and nurturing, or very sweet and very weird. No, it's not on the list. What it was? And it? I don't, and I don't remember the exact yeah. wording. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, I, I really, I mean, I think the funniest is uh, ketchup author mustard agent, but um, I'm not sure if that's the best title. But it's really fun. Well, it's what it was actually the crux of what we've been discussing. To it kind of was, so yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's a funny title and I think it's like catchy. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and so I think, and then I did these weird hand gestures right after. So right, right. Uh, <laughs> it's clickbaity enough. You know? That's right. Right. Yeah. I, I, I'm good with it. I like it. Okay. If you guys think it's good, I mean, you wrote it down, so you must think it's, it's workable. Yep. I do. All right. Let me quickly record that. Welcome to season seven, episode five, a ketchup agent and a mustard author. Welcome back to the show. I am S.A. Baz Collins, and my co-host here is Van Sebastian. And today we have Jason Van He in the hot seat. Jason Van He was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. He writes in several genres and styles, including contemporary fiction, historical fiction, young adult, fantasy, and horror. He once drank at every bar within the city limits of Seattle in a year in order to get out more often. He has worked around the world in the semester, on Semester at Sea, which still amazes him, and we'll have to hear about that. He appeared in a, a, in a movie that was never released, and as a result, has a filmography scattered about the internet that is essentially imaginary. He lives in his home with his husband, Adam. Hey, Jason, welcome back. Welcome to the show. Hi, I'm glad to be here. So, uh, <laughs> what do we start? I almost made you a returning guest. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was secretly actually in the background of a recording you did previously. I was just lurking there. Right, you right. Seen, you might have seen this this tiny you, image of you, my You hair. photo bomb just yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I just kind of yeah. crept through in the background. It's the funny part is, of course, the person you were recording with didn't know I was there. I just snuck right. through their room right. just to hear, right. you know, what it was what it was like live. You and, were the fly uh, on the wall. That's right. Mm -hmm. Or the social butterfly. There we go. As it were. <laughs> Um, so, so well, yes, thank you for having we, me. I'm glad. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, before we jump in today's topics, let's tell people about where you fire started to become an author. Uh, okay, so really, um, so my dad was a writer. Um, he he brought out a handful of books late in life. He was uh, convinced that he was uh, God's gift to the English language, and that therefore he shouldn't be edited or modified or changed in any sort of way, which is why he brought out a series of books late in life, um, because he he couldn't get published before then, because editors would say, we like this, but you have to. And he would say, no, I, I don't. Um, <laughs> turns out they don't usually buy you when you decide that what you have written is already perfect, um, which was his, his standby for a long while, that this was what you were getting. Uh, so I grew up with uh, a father who was a writer, and my grandmother had done some writing too, but she was also a housewife, and so that just wasn't the dumb thing. Um, but she really encouraged me when I was a little kid, anytime I would start scribbling a little story, she'd be like, yeah, finish it. I want to read it. Uh, and so my mom recently, uh, well, not recently, now it's about 10 years ago, I guess, but gave me this, this binder full of all these little uh, myths and folk tales I had written for my grandmother, which was really cute because I didn't remember them at all. I think I was like seven or eight when I was writing them. Um, and they're all very cute. Uh, but that was kind of, I guess, I take it? 
No, sorry. Short stories. I Very. Um, uh, you know, in in pencil, in big hand, right. backwards B's and things. Um, so I've been writing then as long as I can remember, uh, and I, you know, you do these things where you don't think about it, but my my father being a writer was, of course, probably a big inspiration in that. But as a youth, I didn't think of that. I just thought, oh, I'm writing things. Um, I didn't realize that that had somehow implanted itself into my brain as, oh, you know, your dad's a writer. You could do that, too. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that had something to do with it. Um, and then he did succeed in selling some books and he did get published. And then he he died um, before, <laughs> before that amounted to anything. Yeah, he didn't have to do the Fitzgerald thing like by road. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he had like four books come out in, in about four years and then had another book that was already ready to be published and another book that he was working on. And that all, all ended. Um, so I then. Well, you should do the, the Tolkien son thing and finish right. the book he didn't you know. It, I mean, and then write a whole nother book about the notes you had to follow and right. then, you know, then build the treasure map, you know. Yes. <laughs> the thing is, uh, my dad was also no Tolkien. He was he was not he was not anyone. Despite <laughs> despite his illusions of grammar. Right. Right. He he wrote um like pulpy spy shoot 'em up girls in cars novels. Um, what what at the time would have been called men's books um, that you would have Pop found fiction. at like yes that you would have found at like a, a a bus station you know in the little racks where everything is like a this thick book and there's a guy on the front cover with like a gun and there's a lady hanging on his shoulder um, yeah just like mm -hmm. that that's what she looks like mm -hmm. um, <laughs> with the beard yes. <laughs> It was well, the, see, that's what you could do. You could you could know you could do the whole dress <laughs> just to kill thing and just make it you know a drag queen in the end, you know, throw a right. M butterfly in, you know. <laughs> so subvert um, the subvert the plot. <laughs> so that's I guess where it all started. Uh and then cool. I just I just continued writing. I did a lot of short fiction uh when I was younger. I kept thinking, oh, I'll get around to writing a novel, but every time I tried it. Um, and then in my twenties, when I went back to college, I ended up taking writing classes and started a novel that I just finished then and thought, oh, I, I guess novels, that's a thing. Now I can hardly write short fiction. I can only really write novels. So that's how that went. You know, yeah, you should nice. really consider that whole subverting your dad's <laughs> last story because no, I'm telling you because, you know, Seth Graham Greene made a fortune out of writing Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies and taking the Jane Austen sure. novels and being the little brother grabbing his sister's novel and changing it all, you know? <laughs> There's a market for that out there. I'm there, just saying, you know? <laughs> there is a market, except, you know, this was this was 30 years ago when he was never famous, so... Uh, <laughs> well, I then you know. could bring him, bring him fame <laughs> in the right. afterlife. I can recover. <laughs> then you get Whoopi Goldberg to make the movie. <laughs> A lost literary giant. Just, just bring him back into right. the contemporary. Just, you know, I can't even admit that. Well, we're here to talk about your writing. Yes. And more specifically, shopping your writing around. Yeah. So um, when I was about, let's say, 10 years ago now, I met my husband, who you, you mentioned in the intro. Um, and he really encouraged me a lot to do more writing and to try and pursue more writing because I hadn't really, I don't know, a lot of writers have this thing where they're concerned about rejection. I kind of slot deeply into that category. So I've been very bad about submitting things, but my husband was like, no, no, this is all very good. You should, you should need to submit things, do things. Um, and there was a... Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators conference going on and they were going to have an editor out there and you could submit a portion of your novel and then you get an editorial critique. It's a very common thing. Uh, you pay a little extra and whatever. Uh, the editor really liked the, the tiny like five page sample. And so then she liked the 30 pages that you could send after that. And so then she bought the book. And so that's kind of 
that was my my hey let's get published uh was like read these five pages okay buy my book um so that was my novel engines of the broken world that came out in 2013 and i thought well this is this is great like uh, without even doing much I, I got published isn't that wonderful isn't that great um and and i got an agent through a friend uh and and i had an agent and i had a publisher and i had a book coming out and then that all collapsed because the next book they didn't really want and then the agents i had couldn't place another book for me and then eventually they couldn't place the book after that and then eventually they weren't my agents anymore and so um getting your book out there and shopping your novels and doing all that work is a lot um i ended up getting a different agent who was only doing the job part-time it was her side gig and that didn't result in anything and then yeah, it's kind of hard when you're like yeah. working at mcdonald's and you're in the drive right. <laughs> Can we take a look at this? Oh, I my greasy finger. <laughs> ah, um, catch up. <laughs> um, and so I'm more of a mustard author. So that's the uh, thing. Uh, okay. I had a ketchup agent and a mustard author. A and, very Dijon. You know, they just yeah. can't. We, we weren't in sync. We were different condiments. Um, I got to leave this interview. I'm taking you down the garden path. <laughs> and so... Um, Vance is gonna say what Vance is gonna tell me later. He's gonna say, "This is why we can't have nice things." <laughs> <laughs> and so, then I remembered that while just after I got my first agent, an agent who was friends with my first editor had emailed me and said, "Hey, I read your book. It hasn't been released yet, but I read the manuscript. My friend shared it with me. Really like it. Do you have an agent?" And I said, "Oh, yes, I do. I just got one." And she was like, "Oh, darn." And anyway, I remembered that and I looked her up and she was still in the agent business. And I reached out to her and said, hey, you remember me, maybe? It was a few, some years back. And so she emailed me back and said, yes, I do. I really love that book. Do you have something else? And so I sent her a different book, um, which curiously treats with my father um, in a fantasy setting though. Um, and that one, we couldn't really figure out a way to place. We tried, but it didn't take off. And so now we're dealing, so there's, and that will tie into what we're gonna get to later, um, based, okay. on, based on the notes. And there is uh, a purpose to this. <laughs> yes, we are going somewhere. I'm planting seeds right now. So okay. I okay. had this, when we're going I'll down go the garden the path, can. we're walking past the seeds I'm planting. <laughs> I, I'll go get the garden, can, the water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bring in the hose. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Hose, as in water. Right. Yes. <laughs> not the not the other hose. <laughs> Unless you're talking about my dad's novels. Oh well, there Dad, you go. Okay. Right. Right. See, it all now it all right. makes now it, it all, all makes sense. comes together. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so there was that book, uh, and then after that one didn't get placed, my husband just said, "You need to make sure that even though you're not very confident about it, that you send her the best book you have." Um, and I said, yeah, but it's, it's so personal. Um, and then I did it anyway, because my husband told me to do it and, uh, and she loved it. And that's what we're shipping around right now. That's what we're looking to find a home for at this moment is, is this second novel that is also very personal. And so, um, you know, what, what we're going to kind of get to in a little while, he said, getting us back on track, is that we're going to kind of talk about the process of sending out novels and also um, how those novels can be very um, personal and how every time someone says anything about them, they can really hurt more than when, I mean, even more than when you're just shipping out any novel, right? Everything is, is, is the creation of your brain and you're generally very tender. But there are things you can be more tender about and rejections that can hurt more than than the standard. And that's that's part of the danger, I guess, the peril of, of shopping around your your special books. Right. So to take this sort of chronological in terms of the book's life, um, 
what was personal about it? And if you want to, you know, names, names change to protect the innocent, um, change what was personal about it, that's fine. But I'm curious, you know, what in this one, because it sounds like you read a lot of fiction. I do. Um, I, I, I mean, I've written a whole bunch of books. Um, mm -hmm. For So for a long while, I, National Novel Writing Month is probably something that has been mentioned at various points upon this podcast. So I will just Absolutely. assume there's a basic degree of familiarity with the idea that you take November and you write a novel mm -hmm. in that month. Right. So I started and doing- the turkey comes out, so does your novel. <laughs> yes. I have actually finished one during the cooking of the meal. <laughs> and I came out- and they were starting to get ready for, for, for the dinner. This was a Friendsgiving many years ago. And I said, hey, I finished a book just now. And everyone was like, great, it's dinner time. And <laughs> That's I said, awesome. no, but really, I just wrote like 7,000 words since the turkey. And you all get chapter, just like in Nancy <laughs> Mame. <laughs> and they were like, great, it's food. And I was like, oh, <laughs> all right, it is food. That's true. Um, anyway, so I, I started doing that many, many years ago. I think like 2003, 2004 long time ago. And for many years, I was successfully writing a short novel every year. So um, I, I traditionally have been a bit of a stickler because it's supposed to be a 50,000 word novel in a month. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just feel like, oh, I got 50,000 words. I, I succeeded. And I spent a lot of time going, I need 50,000 words with an ending. Like I need to have a complete piece. Um, and so for many years, I did complete every year. And I was writing a whole bunch of novels that were in the, you know, like 52 to 65,000 word length. Just some of them just squeaking over, some of them making it a good distance. But the reason this is important is because um, Engines of the Broken World, which was my published novel, that was actually the novel I wrote in 2010, which was the year I met my husband. And like, I was in love and I was all my cylinders were firing and I was so happy and bouncy and doing everything. And so I wrote this novel and then, you know, kind of pitched it the next year and sold it the year after that. And it came out the year after that. Boom, 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 boom. Um, and that was not in any way the, the personal novel, but it was just that I was feeling like really energized. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, in 2011 though, I wrote the novel that is out now. And it's, um, at the moment, because you know you don't really control the title, but at the moment it's called Never, and it's about the it's it's a, sort of a sequel riff on Peter Pan. Okay, what happens to the youngest kid after he comes back from Neverland, and he um, is very unclear on whether he was actually there or not. What actually happened, you know, because in the in, in both the Disney movie, of course, and the book, you know, that kid is like four, right? right? Like right. he's a little tiny kid. Um, and something like that happens to you when you're four and like it just incorporates into your life. Um, and, and, and that just becomes how you live. And so he, it's the story of him uh, uh, adjusting to life afterwards, fighting in World War I, falling in love with the wrong people, um, deciding that his, his family is in danger from Peter Pan and eventually that he needs to take steps to prevent Peter Pan from threatening his family. Wow. Um, and uh, I wrote it in, um, in about 10 days um, and it was really good. Uh, and uh, I love it, my husband loves it. And when my friends read it, they said, you know, this is about your husband, right? And I said, no, no, absolutely not. No. Mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. And then the next time I read through it, I was like, oh, I mean, maybe a tiny. Mm. Mm. And so then the more I considered it and the more people would sit me down and be like, and this is why it's about your husband. <laughs> <laughs> the more that happened, the more I was like, oh, shit. I guess I did. That. Well, what did he say? Uh, he said, Oh, I guess I could see that sort of. <laughs> All right. <laughs> like he wasn't like, oh yeah, this is definitely about me. Um, it is his his dearest book of mine and like maybe his second favorite book that he's ever read. Um, but I don't know if it's because he's uh, self-absorbed enough to think that it's 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 that it's just right. him, you know, like incorporated into mind. him without even right. realizing right. it. 
right. or whether he actually thinks it's that good. I don't know. I don't. Who knows what goes through the heads of other people? But I don't think he uh, recognized that either, in a, in like an active way. I think he thought there was a few inspired inspired signs there that like connected it to him. But everyone else was like, "No, this is deeply about him. Deeply." Um, my husband, when both long before I met him, well, like five years before I met him, he was in this. Um, life-threatening accident. He was hit and run uh, by a drunk driver. And he was in the hospital for like a month. Giant brain injury, had to be in a coma, um, had to learn how to walk and talk again and everything. And so, you know, that's the kind of experience that is a life-changing thing, um, obviously. And it left him a little different because you don't almost die and just go, yeah, whatever. Um, and I think that there are so many echoes of that in the novel without me really realizing it because there, I mean, there's a sort of similarity of like you go through this experience and it changes you completely. And then how do you adjust to life afterwards? And then, you know, the, the, the character of Michael ends up with some uh, physical disabilities like limping and, and a few other things that simulate what my husband has, which again, didn't occur to me in any way. It just, um, and so it ends up being that the main character. So I have to ask. So I have to ask yeah. quickly: Is your yeah. is your muse Agnes Moorhead? Is Endora hovering above your shoulder? <laughs> no. Um, you know you you know you secretly love that now. <laughs> so you just named your muse. <laughs> anyway. Um. So, I just uh. <laughs> The, the 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 thing of it is that I ended up writing this story that in retrospect was incredibly personal and connected to me in a way that I hadn't realized ahead of time or planned for or intended. Because often, you know, when you're writing, a lot of writers specifically set out and they say, I'm gonna include this element from this and this element from this, and this character is a tribute to this friend and this character I'm gonna name for this person because they have some similar traits or 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 they, they're going to identify with the way that that person wishes they were or things like that. And I, I didn't do that at all, but there it was. So <laughs> there's that. And, and that's partly why sending it out was a very tricky thing because it's very dear to me and very dear to my husband. And what if my agent had read it and said, this is trash or... Mm, but you have to understand that that's all subjective. I mean, even with literary agents, oh, you know, absolutely. some of them have a, a only work with certain style of voices in a certain genre, mm -hmm. and they'll just say, "Well, you know, it, I don't know that." Most of the in, in the things that we've gleaned over the seven years we've been doing this is that even when you're working with literary agents, they just tell you it's not for them. Yes, and, you know, and you know, so it's generally very boilerplate. It's yes. rare when you get someone who says this is absolute garbage. Um, you know, so I think that, <clears throat> and there, and there, and just to put it out there, I just looked it up while you were talking, just to be sure on my reference. But Query Shark is out there, and it's this literary agent who runs a blog mm -hmm. that teaches you how to write query letters and how to create your brand and how to present it to agents and so on and so forth. But you know, when when if somebody said that, I wouldn't want to work with them anyways. I mean, and I come from the world of theater, and collaboration is what it's all about. And if someone has that kind of a god complex that they mm -hmm. say, "Oh, this is trash," you know, I mean, I mean, even Lucy Ricardo got better. You know, she got paid for "Don't Let This Happen to You." You know, um, but you know, so I mean, yeah, I understand. And for me, I when I wrote my series. I intentionally write about fathers and sons because I had such a great father that didn't give me any grief for being gay. And he treated all my gay friends as if he were their dad and stuff. So a lot of my works tend to be between fathers and sons. And that's intentional. And I even, in, in my series, I wove stories about me and my dad mm -hmm. into the two main characters in my novel series. So I get the intention what I think is interesting is that, you know, sometimes 
we have all these familial stories, and I mean even amongst our friend family, mm -hmm. that you've collected over the years, things that have seeped in and kind of moved to the back of that brain sponge you have, and eventually something will trickle forward and you'll get a rivulet of, of, of some old story that will just come to the fore at the appropriate moment. And it's almost like the Harry Potter with the pen sieve. You just, <laughs> you kind of just pull it out and it lands on the page, you know? And, but I think those are the gems. That's what makes writing rich, I think, is when you have those moments of, 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 almost pure in a way genius because you're pulling from life stories mm -hmm. that will make the, the work richer i think so jason how have you prepared yourself for feedback and I, I say feedback because it could be good or bad right so um in the end what i felt like i just had to do was decide that you know there's one thing that i i think for instance my, my dad probably struggled with and that I think a lot of writers struggle with is, you know, I'm, I've created this, this perfect thing. I've created this thing I love and it's absolutely gorgeous and it's exactly what I want it to be. And then I'm going to give it to someone and they're going to tell me it is good. However, you need to change this and 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 this. And then you think, oh God, my perfect thing is being destroyed. But, you know, there's two tiers to that, which is one, uh, you're just one person. And so... You go through the levels of grief. <laughs> right. Well, just yeah. one, you're just one person. And so someone else's input is probably going to make it better because you've written a great book for you. And But you're not the one who's going to buy all those copies, hopefully. Right? I mean, other mm -hmm. people should be out there buying you, your book. Um, and so it helps to have someone else not you, who might be able to tell you what works and what doesn't, which is what your agent is for and your editors are for and, you know, your beta readers are for and all those people who are going to come to you and tell you these things. Now, that still doesn't prevent you from being hurt by some of them, but you have to remember that the goal is to make it a better thing. Um, and then secondly, the version that you loved, the version that was your exact perfect thing is not being purged from the universe. It is not thrown into, into a black hole and, and never to be seen again. You still have that file on your computer or, or my dad, you still have that TypeScript version. Um, and no one can take that away from you. You know, the publisher isn't going to march in your house, mm -hmm. you know, throw you aside and come to your computer and t -t 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 delete. Um, it doesn't happen. Um, so the version you loved, the version that spoke to you so deeply that you were scared to show it to anyone, that's still there. And they're just gonna make you a slightly better version of it. And, and you're gonna be happy. And I also, you know, especially if you've never gone through the process before, I think there's a lot of people who think that your editor is going to tell you what you must do. You must change this. This part doesn't work. You have to do this with this character. And really all they're gonna say is, we'd like you to do this. It'd be great if you did this. I think it'd make a better book if you did this. And if you're like, eh, they're gonna let that fly because they're buying your brain, mm -hmm. not the text. Right. Um, they're interested in you as a writer. And so they they want you to keep, you know, those stories that have conceived out of your head. Um, you know, the, the six different friend stories that all mush together into one great character that you put in. They're not going to say, mm, that character needs to be smoothed out and you're going to go, no. And they're going to go, actually, you have to. Um, because that character is what they bought. They didn't buy their version of the character or, or you would be a ghostwriter or you would be writing for spec, you know? Mm -hmm. And those are entirely different processes than just establishing a standard writer editor relationship. Right. Have you found any healing yeah. in this process? Yeah, so um, that brings me to the other book, really, which is like, uh, my dad was, um, <laughs> in addition to writing like guns and babes and cars books, um, he, he was a bit of a con man, a, a bit. Um, and 
uh, like a really petty con man. He he was, uh, this was his most common um, gig. Uh, he could write really quickly. He really was in many ways a very talented writer. So he carried around a legal notepad with him and he would go out to bars. He was also very good at pool. And he would go out to bars with his legal notepad and he would say, hey, you, you're playing pool right now. I'm going to bet you that I can write a, this was other than hustling people for pool, but he did this as a sideline for hustling people with pool. I'm going to bet you I can write a one page story front and back on this yellow legal notepad, you know, the tall legal notepad, mm -hmm. one page story on any topic you choose. And afterwards, if I get it, you have to give me $5. Keep in mind, this was the 70s. So $5 is a lot of money. Or you have to buy me a drink. And they always chose the drink because the drink was always cheaper, but that was fine because my dad was an alcoholic and that really, you know, funneled his thing. And then he would just, you know, hustle pool for normal money. But this was his writing hustle was he had this legal notepad and he would just. Wow. And there was your story. And I, I doubt they were good stories. Why would they be? You know, you, you wrote them in five minutes. Um, but, you know, they, they kept him in drinks and occasionally someone would give him the money instead. Um, but that's the kind of person he was that he ran these like petty little scams and schemes, um, you know, for a while recently, I'm one of, uh, seven kids from three different marriages. Well, only two marriages and one non-marriage, but that's, uh, and we recently discovered that there was an another marriage that none of us even knew about, um, we contacted the lady. She's in Vegas. She's like 80. She's very nice. Um, she told us some stories about their two-year marriage that we had never heard of. Um, so that was a weird, weird thing to find out. He he lived off of women. Um, he, he stole from them. He got a job in a church uh, as their like cleaning guy, maintenance person, so that he could steal sacramental wine. Um, you know, just the tiniest, pettiest, stupidest scams. He died when I was 20, and um, I hadn't seen him much in maybe the 10 years before then. He had this, he had moved on to the next family, as it were, and I still saw him every once in a while, but he was, you know, they had kids, and, and uh, you know, they were busy, and I didn't really see a whole lot of him. Um, and a couple years before he passed, that marriage ended in divorce. And so he started coming around a little more, as it were, because there they were no more kids. And this was when he was finally getting published and when he was finally starting to think, oh, hey, I have seven kids and no money and no nothing. And what what legacy do I leave? Um, and it turns out he left this legacy of being like a kind of scammy con man because he didn't actually make any of the money that he thought he was going to. But we all have a really sort of complicated set of feelings about this person because he was not much use. Um, he, for a while after my parents split up, we were the ones where there was no marriage, although we thought there was story. Uh, he had custody of us, but he had custody only because he had like kind of been threatening about it. And, and my mom was paying his rent and my mom eventually was like, I can't afford to pay your rent anymore. And he said, okay, well, you can have the kids. And so he didn't have custody because he wanted it. He had custody as a way to extort money. <laughs> so uh, there's this whole weird set of feelings of like, oh, okay, he's your father and you love him. And like late in life, you kind of reconnected a little more solidly. And he's also a bum and he's kind of useless. And he, he died owing you the $10 he borrowed from you when you were nine that he never bothered repaying. Cause why would he? Um, and so I wrote this, the, the book that my editor tried, my current editor tried to place and didn't is about um, it's about a guy and he has inherited his father's business and a lot of his father's debts and problems and things in a fantasy city he runs a magic shop. They sell oddments and trinkets and, and a guy shows up one day and is like, Hey, uh, I need the thing I left with your dad like 10 years ago. And the main character is like, well, you know, my dad's been dead for like 12 years. So I don't really know what you're talking about. Um, 
And so it's this whole complicated confrontation of what your father's petty criminal past means to you uh, as expressed through a fun, loving, fantasy, rollicking caper yeah. novel. Um, <laughs> and it was a lot. Um, and I feel better and happier about my relationship with my father for having written that. So I would say that's definitely a healing thing to, to write out intentionally in this case, um, people from your life and to create a kind of ending or closure with them that maybe you don't you know, get in regular life. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, another writer friend of mine kind of led me to it. We, we hadn't, we used to be friends many years ago and then I ran into him at a science fiction convention and we sat and we talked for a while and he talked about how he had just um, written a book. His, his dad never cared that he was a writer and didn't um, read anything that he, had. he would send his dad his books and his dad was like, great. Never read anything, never did anything. And late in life, again, his dad was, um, you know, in hospital and dying and uh, he frantically felt inspired to write this book that dealt with him and his father again in a, in a fantastical setting and then read it to his dad, um, you know, before he passed and his dad said, oh, that, that, was, that was pretty good. I liked that, <laughs> um, you know, dads. Uh, I mean, not, not yours, but <laughs> other dads. Um, yeah, my, my, my friends would have what begged to differ with my dad. Yeah, yeah. And so- <laughs> We um, were the Kool-Aid house. We were where, the get, where they all went to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was my mom, not my dad. So- <laughs> Okay, okay um, fair enough. And he was telling me about that. And that's when I thought, well, maybe- I need to do that. Maybe I need to write that that version of that novel for me, even though my dad's been dead, you know, at that point by like 27 years or something. And clearly I'm not gonna be able to read it to him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he never, he died before I finished a novel. He died before I ever came out to him. Um, a lot of things just feel a very unfinished there. And right. so it's nice to be able to uh, literally rewrite that history and change what was. I have, so what's been the journey since you, you? I mean, if you've written that, and you, I mean, is that the one you're shopping now? No, that was the one we tried to shop, but it's a weird sort of novel because it's, uh, it's, it's, in, it's inspired by the Maltese Falcon. Uh, so it's like a, <laughs> a funny <laughs> fantasy noir. And that's not really a, a strong genre. Right. Um, it's a pretty hard sell. And so that one didn't, it, we got some nice comments. So are, are there any queer, I'm sorry, Vance, are there any queer characters in these stories or? Is yes, there... um, so, okay. so, so yes, the, the, the main character who is effectively me uh, and his husband, you know, take over the shop and, and there are others in there as well. Um, the femme fatale, because, you know, you can't have a, a, a Maltese Falcon without a femme fatale, is actually a boy fatale. And um, Michael Darling in Never is also very gay. Um, nice. Okay. Um, there are other people in the in the book who are much less gay and much more British public school. But um, <laughs> That's fantastic. still. So I'm going to ask a question, okay. and I'm going to ask yeah. it twice, but for two perspectives. Okay. What would you like authors to know about what we've talked about today? Okay, so, um, well, some things that we've talked about, and I think everyone's on the same, the very same page as this, is um, you even you'll never diminish your life by putting your own experiences in it. Those aren't things that you need to keep precious and and secret. Um, if it, if it's awful for you to to put I don't know, your pain or your experiences out there, that that's not something you should do. But mm -hmm. you know, I think that there is, a, there are kind of like, uh, I don't know, two differing schools of thought. One is, you know, you should write what you know. And in that sense, you should be writing your own experiences and everything. Um, but then there are also people who feel like you should never be writing your own 
life and experiences because why aren't you just writing biography or a memoir or something? You know, why aren't you writing a, a travel log? Um, but there are ways to write your own life that are not direct. There are ways to write your experiences that give you a little distance from them and maybe make them a little more comfortable if they were uncomfortable to begin with and that allow you to really be authentic. And, you know, like, like Box was saying, you know, like make those stories that connect to your life and your experiences and the way that you and your father, you know, lived and how those, those stories make everything stronger, you know, because they, they're going to read more authentically and more vitally than if you're making it up out of whole cloth. Well, you know, and it's also, I, I would, the thing that I would counter with it also is that, you know, I always love when people say, oh, well, someone would never do that. So-and-so would never do that. That, that character just a child uh, with all the shit I've seen in my life. Trust me, there's someone out there who would do X, Y, and Z that you say would never happen. Yeah. So it's kind of like you have to almost, and I don't want to say be argumentative, but you have to present it in a way that I think that if it's a challenging story, a story that most people would find uh, uh, have a, a hard time getting past that suspension of disbelief, that I think you market it in a way that actually highlights the, the reasons why the quirky, because even when people do something weird, like I had, you know, I was just having this conversation with my family member. I seem to have inherited <clears throat> by osmosis my Thea Lola's um, sense of humor and her way of doing my family as of late have been commenting how I will just throw something humorously out there that she would have said or done. And it's kind of like I've, I've pulled that in and made it something of my own. And she was a wild lady. She, she did all kinds of stuff. She never took anybody. She suffered no fools. She never, you know, took, you know, prisoners. Um, if she was coming for you, you knew she was coming for you, you know, she, but she was a very funny lady. And I, I, I think about, you know, if I was going to write a semi-autobiographical thing of my, you know, my family's bizarre. My family really is bizarre. My dad had 23 brothers and sisters. They lived on a reservation. We have to rent Rhode Island when we have a family reunion, you know, so people would go, there's no way that's real. There's no way that's real. Yes, it is. Life is so messy. <laughs> You know, and I think it's weird when we try to put them into these genres and try to put them in clever little marketing boxes. And I get the business of it, but think of how many stories we've lost because authors were told, oh, no, that, that just doesn't fly. That doesn't work mm -hmm. for me. You know, you know what I mean? I do. Um, and, and especially because everyone has one of those stories about Mm -hmm. You know, the 23 brothers and sisters and the living on the reservation and having the red Rhode Island. Everyone has one of those stories, but a lot of people think they're the only one in the world. Right. That's exactly. And yet we watch, we, we go, we go with my big fat Greek wedding and we go, oh my God, they're Greek, but that's my family too, you know, yep. and you're Russian immigrants. You know, I mean, it, it, people don't give, I think, the human element enough credit or enough due that we have far more in common than we do the differences between us. And I think that's what authors should focus on is, is that hum, human element that is real, that is bizarre, that is so off the wall, strange, you know, and yet it, it's what life is, you know, life is messy, you know, it just, you know, why, why do you think Shakespeare had so many bizarre concepts when he wrote all of his stuff? Because that shit was going on around him, you know? I mean, I just think that that's something that that um, authors need to kind of, you know, for me, it's all about the creative process. I could give a shit if somebody actually loves and buys the book after it's out there, because I'm like Hitchcock. I like that creative process. I like building the world. I like writing the world. I like talking about it and, and, and getting it to a place where I feel really comfortable and I've got my groove and whatever. Um, and I've learned, and I don't know if it's because it being in, coming from classical theater, you do what you do, you do the art, and it's up for others to interpret it. You mm -hmm. know, I never read reviews of the shows we did. I never did. I, I just, I can't put myself in that place because 
after it's out as art, it's not yours anymore. So mm -hmm. you have to just let it go and let it be what it's going to be, um, good, bad, or indifferent. You know, Lance Vance and I have pointed out many times the one thing that all authors agree is you'd rather have really, really good or, oh, man, this sucks, but you don't want mm -hmm. eh, because fine. Eh, it doesn't give you anything, you know? So that almost led it, and then it went on a tangent, that almost led into the second perspective of my question. What about oh, our yeah, topic? That. Yeah, <laughs> that. What about our topics today would you like readers to know? Oh, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce back a minute uh, sure. to say that, you know, as a writer, I often find myself reining in when there's too many weird coincidences or too much like, could that really happen um, in the in the non totally because that you know a lot of what I write is fantasy so in the non totally fantastical parts like the human relationships and things which are to be honest more fantastical than anything else but mm -hmm. we encounter them every day so we don't feel they're fantastical and I often rein things in and don't do that I have twenty three brothers and sisters I don't do that I'm one of seven kids stretching over thirty two years um, from and mystery wives and things like that I don't do those things because they seem too improbable they strain the sense of belief more than also i'm a wizard and i just made a castle right, right. You know, right. one of those is easy to accept and the and other that says like, a lot really? about society <laughs> that says yeah, a lot about you know. society <laughs> and so um what about these topics i i think that readers so i think that and this i've done this as a reader too uh the contr the the contrast to me saying you should put these things in there and you should um, you know, be putting your real life in there is that I think a lot of readers assume that people are always putting their real lives in there. You know, they're thinking, oh, you know, Jason wrote about, uh, well, my first book had a lot of religious themes. And I had, I, there were reviews where people were like, this guy's like a religious freak. <laughs> um, and I'm a lifelong atheist. You know, I grew up without any religion whatsoever. I don't, I only know what I've read. Um, but there were people thinking that this was me talking about like the, my religious perspective and like the, my upbringing and everything. <laughs> and so I think that there's a contrary idea to telling a writer to put these things in, to tell a reader to not think everything is put in that way. Um, because, you know, just because I'm writing about, I don't know, a, a cheating relationship with an extra cheating relationship on the side and stuff doesn't mean that I'm a cheater just because I'm, right. you know, right. writing with intricacy. And this is something that, you know, like nobody thinks in general, nobody thinks that like people writing murder mystery novels are actually out there killing people. Right. 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 It's for nobody, research. <laughs> Nobody thinks, aha, he actually killed the mayor of his town to figure out how this would work. <laughs> but they do think that when they read about, you know, just to take like the, this kind of stereotypical example, they often think that when they read the like highbrow white male literary novel about a bored professor sleeping with one of his students, they often think, oh, well, that guy does teach creative writing classes. He's probably sleeping with his students. Um, and he has the leather patches on it. Yes, he does. <laughs> My husband really wants me to get one of those jackets if I ever teach. <laughs> leather patches. Um, and a wingback chair. You must have the wingback chair. <laughs> and, um, and so I think that there is, there's an idea that if you're writing about things in the human condition, experienceable things, things that we all go through, that's got to be the truth. That's got to be what you're actually doing. Um, and, you know, when someone does something bad, people then kind of pick through their old writings and are like, well, here's the sign and here's the sign and here's, you know, all these things. And that could be true, but maybe they just changed in the last year and became jerks or, you know, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, like when you look at, okay, when you look at JK Rowling and think, well, <laughs> she's a piece of work now, but then people are looking back through books she wrote like 20 some odd years ago and going, oh, here's a sign. Oh, here's a... Maybe it is, but maybe she just got radicalized in the last right. five years, you know, or maybe she was a little bit awful 20 years ago, but you can't be like, this sentence tells us that she was, you know, a mom's net transphobe back in 1996. 
that's not how it wasn't it even part of the, the conversation right but, you know, right yeah. um she's been secretly planted it all through because that's her true belief coming out um Maybe. I swear, some of the, some of these woke kids are sleepwalking. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, you know, and th maybe there is something to it because you know, we do. All writers do kind of slip in some parts of themselves. You can't create something that doesn't involve you at all. Mm -hmm. I don't feel. Um, I mean, you could maybe in like a class exercise, but it would be a real stretch, and you wouldn't like probably write an entire novel of it or a seven book series. Um, but you know, the fact that it has some aspects of you or that it comes from your viewpoint and worldview, as it must, because it's your brain writing it, doesn't mean that every single word in it is you. And as right. a reader, right. you don't, you shouldn't believe that every word is, or that even the things where you're like, ew, that was kind of gross. That's probably what that person's really like. That's probably not true. They probably did a lot of research. They probably knew people who had similar experiences they might have been the person that the awful thing was done to and they're working it out by writing as the person who does it you know there's there's all sorts of reasons that it can be and and i also think that there's an aesthetic that can be part of the brand i was just thinking while you were saying that you know you have guillermo del toro who you know does, i mean yes he has a house that is filled with a lot of horror memorabilia and he writes to that kind of thing and obviously was an influence but you know he doesn't live that life um and then you think of like tim burton whose entire aesthetic is built on the whole thing of oh yeah you know what he actually does live like that you know i right. mean so well or like john waters who like yeah, yeah john waters films definitely are a window into his brain space mm -hmm. he's mm -hmm. not really stretching hugely far from that in like right. eating poo and being disgusting. You know, maybe I sincerely doubt he's he's eating poo, but you know, it's not something that's that far from his mind. It's clear enough right. that it's part of that collective right. consciousness. Right. Yeah. right. All right. Um, so, so yeah, uh, as a writer, put it in there, but as a reader, don't think it's all Ben put in there. Everyone yeah. needs to, to take a call. Bravo. Bravo, very well said. Um, <laughs> So we talked a little bit about what's coming up next for you. You're shopping never around. Right. Is there yeah, so, anything else you'd like people to know? Uh, yeah. So, um, I mean, this is this is a complete sideline, really. But I also I write I write role playing games because um, fantasy, and um, that's one of that's now one. Now you of, just made him perk up. <laughs> that's that's, <laughs> that's one of my like excuses that actually matters. So when I was a little tiny kid, um, my dad, thanks, dad. This is this is like the one great thing he did. Uh, when in like 1978, when I was like six years old, I might have been seven, six or seven, somewhere around there. He bought me the original, uh, not the, quite the original, but the the blue basic D and D set. Which, if you if you know D and D, there was this like weird period where they had like originally some three little booklets, mm -hmm. and then they were gonna bring out Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So as part of a, a attempt to screw over one of the co-founders, but. In between, they brought out this thing called Basic Dungeons and Dragons that was supposed to kind of like allow you to springboard from these booklets that you had used to this new Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. But Advanced Dungeons and Dragons hadn't been written yet. So the springboard actually went nowhere. You jumped on it and then you you just ended up in this pit. Because it had nothing to do with the product, with the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons product, because that wasn't done yet. Um, and so after that, they then decided to transform it into advanced and basic. And they had these two lines running for many years. Well, my dad bought this box set and it was basic. It said so on the cover. Um, and we were very young and my brother and I kind of halfway figured out how to play it. He's a year and a half older than me. So he was like nine and I was like seven. And we were like, I guess you roll some dice and you put things on this piece of paper. Um, we had to explain it to my mom and my stepdad. I mean, my dad and my stepmom. Scratch that, reverse it. And um, then we, you know, we, we went ahead and we did that. And then um, my dad, and then we were at a, at a store and we saw that there was this advanced Dungeons and Dragons. The, the first book was out and we saw, and it said advanced and we had had basics. So we were ready to move on to advanced. We were like mm -hmm. a year older, you know? Um, and so we did that promptly and made even a bigger hash of that. But it started a lifelong love of role-playing that I, I continue to do. And so, uh, I started writing games, uh, but I was treating it in the same way 
I was writing books. Uh, I'm never going to show anyone anything because what if they don't like it? But now I finally reached a point in my life where I'm like, if you don't like it, that's really not about me. That's it's just, you know, it's what it is. Mm-hmm. Can't please everyone. So I kickstarted a game um, called Strange Hills last year. So, uh, and late last year. And so that's just coming to print like right about now. And the, the PDF is available. It's called Strange Hills by me, Jason Daniel. And uh, right. it's, it's a horrible game about uh, like a post-apocalyptic civilization where the final city in the world has died and some of the former oppressive classes are, are trying to find somewhere else to live along with various low-class people around them who they might hideously abuse while they're out there. But the game's about finding a last chance for redemption because it's all about trying to see whether your characters will become better before they inevitably die because there is literally nowhere else in the world. Wow. So... <laughs> yeah. Where do people find this and what social should they follow for announcements? So uh, it is on um, Drive Through RPG, which is a big site to get RPGs on. And it's going to be on itch because I have to put up community copies because we funded those. Um, itch.io, uh, which is a tiny little site that uh, for very low cost and run by a very generous person. Um, allows people really tiny designers to put out their games and it's full of all sorts of strange and interesting games. So if you like games, uh, itch.io, it also does a whole lot of computer-based games and under the same thing. So um, most of it is computer games really. And it's a lot of people putting up their like tiny little dream projects and it's it's very sweet and very weird. Um, and uh, I, I do have a Twitter, but I scarcely use it. So really I'm just, I just, I don't really do much social media. Um, That's fair. It, it rots my brain and I feel awful after I look at it. Um, I'm one of those people where I'm like, I do scroll for an hour. Now I want to go yeah, no. throw myself into that pit that I sprang off of the basic D&D into. Um, <laughs> do you have a, a website where you announce um, these things? I built one and then I tore it down. So I don't at the moment. Okay, that's fair. I, I need to get another one at some point, but um, I'll do that when like never's coming out. Uh, <laughs> Which hopefully will be soon. You'll go to WebSRS and go combing through the, oh, I'll take this website. <laughs> I like this background. It's got a penguin. Um, <laughs> nice. Just don't hey. get Benedict Cumberbatch to narrate it. <laughs> it's a picture of Succotash. And um, <laughs> no. <that's laughs> All right. Uh, any final words of wisdom for folks? I, I don't, I didn't give any first words of wisdom. Why am I going to wrap up with some last You gave ones? an entire episode full of wisdom. <laughs> dropping wisdom um be kind to yourself more than anyone else even that's that's i guess the wisest thing i can say is like forgive yourself like you would your best friend um forgive yourself like you would your child like you would your dog um don't forgive yourself like you would you because you're going to be mean to yourself and don't freaking do that you're going through a lot i don't Mm -hmm. care who you are you're going through a lot and and you need some niceness. Very nice. All right, folks, Written on the Edge is produced by Rogue Ravens Media. For our disclaimers, links to social media, our listen stations, or to sign up as a guest, visit www.rotepodcast.com. If you enjoy learning about new artists, please like and subscribe so you get alerts for new episodes. Support us on Patreon or hit our merch store if you want to support us by buying something cool that you can wear or drink out of. And Baz is currently working on some new designs that we will air very soon. We'd like to extend a huge thank you to Jason Vanney for being with us. Jason, thank you so much. You are so very welcome, actually. This was incredibly fun, and I'm super happy I came on. I'm glad you did, too. We'll come back whenever, if, when it gets placed. Come, definitely come right? Back and tell or when it fails horribly, and then we can talk about that process. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or then. <laughs> All right, everyone. As you were told, be kind to yourself and forgive yourself. Have we'll the talk. courage to be kind. Exactly. Yes. It's really hard to not be... Ironic and sarcastic and mean these days, right? Mm-hmm. It's really hard. All right. Thank you, everyone. We love you, and we'll talk to you all again soon. Bye-bye. Oh, what's that? Closing time. Bums rush and melody, dear.